no mud, no lotus. And this is the idea that you, the lotus flower, which is the symbol of enlightenment, it grows in the pond through the disgusting, icky, gooey mud at the bottom, which is like gross. And the idea that like we need muck and mud, we need compost, like gardeners know we need disgusting cow poop and rotten vegetables <laughs> to grow beautiful flowers. And it's the same with us. Like we need these difficulties. We need those difficult moments. We need all that to, to be able to become more compassionate, have that perspective, you know, have compassion for our kids, have compassion for ourselves. No mud, no lotus. I love that. Hi, this is Danae. I'm the founder of Simple Families. Simple Families is an online community for parents who are seeking a simpler, more intentional life. In this show, we focus on minimalism with kids, positive parenting, family wellness, and decreasing the mental load. My perspectives are based in my firsthand experience raising kids, but also rooted in my PhD in child development. So you're going to hear conversations that are based in research, but more importantly, real life. Thanks for joining us. Hi there. Thanks so much for tuning in. That voice you heard in the intro is Hunter Clark Fields. Hunter has been on the podcast before, and I love her voice. She is a fellow podcaster herself. She's the voice behind Mindful Mama Mentor, and she's the author of the best-selling book, Raising Good Humans to which she has a follow-up book coming out this summer, Raising Good Humans Every Day. Today, she and I are discussing a topic which we both have plenty of personal and professional experience with, and that's reactivity. How do we understand the nature of our own reactivity and that of our children's? If you're human, you have probably overreacted to something that your kid did, or something that your partner did, or your boss did. I did want to mention before we get started that we are going to be moving to monthly episodes starting in July. So while I won't talk with you next week, I will talk with you in July. Without further ado, here's my chat with Hunter. Hi, Hunter. How are you? Hi, Danae. So happy to talk to you. Yeah, you you were on the show before, but it's been years, like maybe it's been like know, 2018. I don't know. A really long, long time. time. Yeah. yeah. Welcome back. I'm glad to be here. I, I feel at one with the simplicity <laughs> people. I feel like these are my people, you know, right. like you get to, you understand what to focus on, what's important. Yeah. I love yeah. that. Not always easy to stay focused on that, but we know the goal, right? No. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I wanted to talk to you today. I kind of have a variety of things I want to pick your brain on, um, but I want to talk a little bit about reactivity in parenthood. Tell us first, what is it when I say reactivity, what, what comes up for you? This is us on autopilot, right? And it can be any number of things it, to me. Okay. So reactivity is like, yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was at this beautiful garden center a few weeks ago with my kids and my husband, and there was a guy pulling a little wagon with two toddlers. And we heard him like, say like, if you hit your brother again, I'm going to smack you. And that's reactivity. That's like, these words are coming out of my mouth and I don't even know where they're coming Mm -hmm. from. Like, I'm not thinking about them. Like, it wasn't like a conscious choice to say that, right? He wasn't like, let me think about the good things to say. No. So I'm in a lot of ways, like, I don't want to like throw this like random guy under the bus, but it's because it wasn't his choice. It was like something his parents said, something he's heard in his culture Mm -hmm. all around him. This is reactivity and it can be yelling or it's us saying something idiotic that we actually didn't choose. Like we just, it just comes out of our mouth, like, like verbal, verbal vomit and, and whatever it is. And, and we're not using our thinking, our, our thinking brain and with our kids, you know, and, and we can talk about like how that happens in the brain and stuff like that, but that's reactivity. That's really what I struggled with. That's why I do everything I do is because yeah. I was really kind of reactive Right. And it's funny that I feel like our kids are all reactive because they're still learning their works in oh, progress, yeah. as are we. But our kids react to things and we get frustrated with their reactivity. But we also do. And I think we easily lose sight of that. Yeah. Yeah. We it's so much easier to see in somebody else than it is yeah. in us. Right. Um, yeah. No, our kids have like 
no prefrontal cortex. It's not, I mean, they have some prefrontal cortex, but <laughs> they have, it's not fully developed in, until they're in their twenties. And when yeah. they're like five and below, they really, really have very little prefrontal cortex. And it's so hard for us to, to pause and, and make a thoughtful choice about how to respond. But yeah, reactivity is like, when we're we're in a moment with our kids, it's frustrating. We're kind of, we're just, it, it either happens, reactivity happens a couple ways. Like it's either we're not thinking, we're not really fully present and we're just saying something mindless or we're in a frustrating moment. Our kids aren't listening. We're feeling tense. The little brother's hitting the other kid, you know, and you're just like, ah, there are people around me. And when our stress response really kicks in, right, like as we start to feel stressed, the unfortunate part of our biology is that 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 cuts off the slower parts of our brain. And the slower parts of our brain are that prefrontal cortex area, which is like behind our forehead, which is controls verbal ability, problem solving ability, creativity, impulse control, like it's all the things. <laughs> Those are all the things we need to parent well. And so we don't have access to it where we have less access to it. It's that whole Dan Siegel, you know, mm -hmm. this brain flip your lid moment where, where our whole brain isn't working together. So to me, I see that as the heart of like everything we want to do in parenting is to like calm our reactivity because otherwise we have no chance. You know, like I remember being so frustrated and listening to sort of parenting gurus kind of tell me how to respond. And I'd be like, okay, I'm going to respond this way next time. And that's what I'm going to do. And then I would never, ever be able to do it because I had to deal with my reactivity first. I had, because like, it would yeah. just fly. Like it was, my brain was sabotaged by myself <laughs> and, and it was, it was useless. It was useless. And all that stuff is useless unless you deal with your reactivity. So that always has to be a foundation. Right. Yeah. I, um, was a really messy kid, which obviously most people listening to this podcast know that that's <laughs> sort of how this all, where this all came from was my history of messiness. So I was the kid that was just always leaving my mess everywhere. Um, and that kid is also one of the kids that I'm raising. And it's interesting <laughs> how reactive, oh. even though I'm really conscious of it, I'm so reactive. Like this morning she mm. was, um, it was like, two minutes before the bus came and I looked down at her and she literally had her whole breakfast on her pants, like covered in cream cheese. <laughs> and I just like, I, I felt my whole body tense up, right? Because like the bus is about to come, she's covered in cream cheese. And like, I didn't even say anything, but the tension in my body and the way that I was physically reacting caused her to react and cause shame. Mm. And I think that's something, that's something I see with my reactivity is a lot of times that it elicits shame in my kids. Do you hear that pattern a lot? Mm. Well, it's interesting because I actually just want to like high five you for a second because like <laughs> it probably back in the day, you would have said something, you know, maybe unskillful in right. that moment. And then it really would have been too, a, like but... a little shade and storm, right? Yeah. You know, like it <laughs> happens, right? I mean, you held it in, in, the, in the, that restraint. That's a big part of like that piece, right? Like, and, and that's a big piece of mindfulness, right? It's like being able to sit with the discomfort of like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm having a really uncomfortable feeling. And yet I'm just staying, I'm sitting, I'm staying here and I'm not, you know, spewing it out on everybody. So I, that's awesome. Like, Thanks. good job. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah, you're not a paragon of acceptance of dirt, in your life. And that's okay. Like you're allowed to have that moment. I mean, I don't know if we, I would say maybe, you know, I, I wouldn't, it'd be hard to say if like, it's this is all nonverbal, if this is shame or guilt, for mm -hmm. your kid, you mm -hmm. know, um, she guilt is actually a pretty pro social emotion. Right. And guilt is like, Oh, I did something or I didn't do something like clean myself up. Right. That's, you know, that I, I should actually have done. Right. And that's actually that's actually a good thing. You know, it's okay for mm -hmm. kids to feel that it's, it's pro-social for them to feel that if it, you know, if it's shame, like I'm a terrible person, like, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not sure. Like that would be a lot to be getting just from a non-verbal reaction. That's yeah. what I'm guessing. Well, I think when you have this pattern repeatedly that mm, it's sort mm -hmm. of sometimes the guilt shifts to shame, like, Oh, I always do this. Yeah, or I am yeah, a messy I kid. And I, this. 
Yeah. I felt like that a lot as a kid. Like this is part of my identity. Like this is the bad part of Mm -hmm. me, right. That always makes the mess. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to untangle that as a parent. And, you know, I tried to, I was reflecting on it after she got on the bus this morning and I was thinking like, well, what's the worst that could happen if I sent her on the bus covered in cream cheese? And I think my understanding, my real fear around that, which is that the teachers or other parents that might see her think that I'm like lacking in some way that I let my kid like get on the bus covered in her breakfast. And I think that for me comes up, maybe that plays a big role in my reactivity, worried about what other people are going to think. Yeah, that's really common. I mean, that's very, very common for, for so many of us. And I, you know, I think in that moment, you know, all of these things come up and it's all really helpful to understand where they come from. And I think in that moment, something that's even more helpful would have just, you know, like say you could like rewind from today, you just say, oh my goodness, you're noticing that I'm, I've noticed the mess and it makes me feel uncomfortable. You know me, it makes me yeah. feel uncomfortable to see mess and just to like name what everybody's feeling in that mm-hmm. moment that would lower the whole temperature. And just like, cause that's the whole, like this whole shame thing, it breeds in silence. Yeah. So if we can name it and then that might've then you, you might've said like, Oh, I, you know, I know I've got a, I've got a mess thing, honey. I love you. Go to school. Bye. Right. You know? Yeah. No, that's a good point. Naming it and, and explain it because sometimes when we react, we don't necessarily let them know uh, why we're reacting. Mm-hmm. Right. And it just feels like this, like, big emotion coming out. Um, I had another mess yeah, thing yeah. like two, two weeks ago. We, so we haven't had a washer and dryer for three months cause we're renovating. And so we've been going to the laundromat and it's been a lot, a lot of stress added that to the regular stresses of life. And, um, so we have been going to the laundromat once a week with like a giant pile of laundry and it's, it takes a long time. So I had, we had come back from the laundry net. My husband went and he brought the clothes back. I was folding them. I had this giant pile of clothes and I had a spin drift, a sparkling water. They're like kind of colored. I don't yeah, know if yeah. you've seen those. They're like, they have like a bit of a hue to them, even though it's sparkling water. So um, I had it sitting on the side of the, on the arm of the sofa, not a great place to put it. And my daughter knocked it all over the pile of clean clothes, the, so poured it all over. <laughs> and that was such a big reaction. I was so reactive to that. But not because she was bad, but because I didn't have a way to fix this, right? I don't have a washer and dryer. I can't just throw this stuff right back into the washer and dryer. Um, So it's, I think that part, like if I would have named that, right? Like explaining why this situation Mm. made me feel so especially upset on this particular day that maybe they can hear that and understand our process a little better. Definitely. Definitely. I mean, and that's really, really important. It's never too late to do that. In fact, you could do it today if you hadn't, you know, just like, because kids will tell stories about and misrepresent parents' motives, you know, and because we're, kids are egocentric, like most Mm -hmm. of us, you know, like they think everything is about them and revolves around them. So like, yeah, they may tell a story that's all my fault and I'm a terrible person. And so this is actually, you know, it's really, really important to come back and explain to your kids like, oh no, this was me, right? That I, I had this this, you know, I, I, I'm stressed because of the laundry. Yeah. Because I mean, we're not going to get through it without conflict, right? Mm-hmm. Conflict is going to happen. Sparkling water will spill. <laughs> Worse things will spill. You're lucky you're not like a regular Coca-Cola drinker and that right. was all over it. Right. That's going to happen. And so all that, you know, we can't avoid it. We can't avoid conflict. It's super normal. Siblings have conflict on average once an hour. Teenagers have conflict with their parents on average once a day. This is what the research shows mm. us. So like, this is normal. So, you know, then, but the repair of like coming together and like saying, this is what was going on for me. I'm sorry. All those things like that actually can bring you closer than if you didn't have any conflict at all. So that's yeah. the bright side of conflict is that it actually can bring bring you closer, which is nice because, I mean, I know we have plenty of cl- conflict too. <laughs> yeah. we. I recently made her a little bracelet with the phrase, not perfect, but wonderful. And that's something oh, we've been using a lot. And um, it's funny how that. sometimes little phrases like that can stick and that reassurance that you're not perfect, but you're still wonderful. Um, that's something that we're, we're leaning heavily on now that kind of, um, we are room for making mistakes, right. For all of us. I've been using it on myself too. 
<laughs> in those nice. moments. <laughs> yeah, we we all really need those reminders. I think also like people who grew up like kind of, you know, in, maybe in my generation, like there was a lot of like emphasis on self-esteem and like, you're amazing, you're great. And, you know, achievement at school, like I was paid for my grades and stuff, which we now know is like a really bad thing to do. To, it's actually demotivating. But um, luckily, I didn't really care for about that dollar, like a an A by the time I was in high school. Anyway, uh, it you know, so I think a lot of us are tend to be like really like outwardly focused, like achievement focused, right? Like we're just like, you know, things have to be a certain way. And, you know, I, I have to have that grade. I have to have that appearance. I have to, you know, and, and that um, can hamstring us from being able to enjoy life and enjoy parenting because it's so messy. It's yeah. so imperfect. And it's so, there's all that stuff. Um, yeah, that practice of acceptance and acceptance of imperfection is like a really, really deep, powerful practice mm -hmm. for parents. Yeah, that um, that stat around siblings fighting once per hour sounds about right, at least maybe in the summer, twice per hour. I wonder if they could do that research <laughs> seasonally, winter too. <laughs> <laughs> Any times of, of extreme um, enmeshment, lots of time spent together. Um, but I think about the sibling relationship because it can be something that we as parents really react to strongly, right? When we see mm -hmm. those things, the the disagreements, like we want to jump in and we want to fix them. And I mean, mm -hmm. even with adult siblings, right? Like I'm one of four and I still see that like uh, like the grandparent, my, my kid's grandparents wanting to fix things between the adult siblings. So that it, it, I think about playing the long game on the sibling relationship. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you think about that, right? Jumping in and fixing it versus letting things play out. And one might bring mm -hmm. you more peace in the moment versus one might bring you more peace in the long run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. Siblings, it can, it's tough, right? Because actually like that relationship can have like really great positive or negative impacts on people like throughout their life, right? Like the sibling relationship, you know, I think the long game is like, let's, we want to create a culture of respecting each other of like, you know, this is your family. We care for each other. We treat each other with respect and things like that. I think, yeah, the short game is like you have to get along at all times and you always have to share and all of those right. things, right? And that's that's not true. Like kids are going to be in different stages and ages and things like that, right? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, we we have been in a stage of overparenting um, our kids, um, especially our younger kids, kind of like trying to control them too much. And not that we should just step back and do nothing. Like we, if our kids are fighting and, and like it's looking dangerous, like get in there and separate them out, you know, but we don't have to fix all our kids problems. And I think that's at the heart of like, we have to kind of think about that with our sibling relationships, right? Like they're going to fight. They're going to have arguments. Once an hour is the research. So, you know, they need a chance to be able to work out their arguments themselves, right? And sometimes you may go in and you may coach them through it, right? And you 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 know you can coach them into, okay, you're feeling this and you're feeling this and okay, he he says this, she says this. How do you think we can work this out, right? Like we can think of ourselves as a coach, um, but we never want to think of ourselves as judge and jury, right? okay, I decide you do, you have done this, you have done this, you go to your room, you go over here. We want to think of ourselves as a coach, as somebody who's encouraging our sibling, the kids to have respectful relationships with each other. They don't necessarily have to always like each other or always love each other. Um, that We want to just encourage like respectful, compassionate treatment, right? Like you know, I know you feel this way. That's really frustrating. He did this, but we can't do, you know, we can't whack our brother in the head, right? Or whatever it is. So I think that the the pithy kind of response in, in these moments that's helpful is like, coach, don't control, you know, and that, you know, sometimes you just got to like, put your fingers in your ears and go, la, 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 la. I'm not, I don't, um, it's not my 
problem. It's not my problem. You know, Hunter said to say it's not my problem. <laughs> uh, you know, until like blood is about to be drawn. And then like go in. And then some, you know, it's it's a little bit of uh it's a messy middle and not a perfect straight line with siblings. Yeah. Yeah. I think about um the house that we lived in from the time my kids were like one and three until they were like four and six, I want to say. Um the playroom was like fairly far from the kitchen, like two rooms away from the kitchen. It was kind of like in a breezeway between where the garage and the um, house were. And that at first when we moved in, I was like, oh, I'm going to hate this, like having the kids so far away playing. But it actually ended up being a really good thing because I didn't hear every single little squabble. Uh, Like I could hear it kind of from a distance, but I wasn't like in the thick of it, right? When I was cooking or doing things in the kitchen, which I frequently am, that you know, I, I had a little distance on it and I think that helped all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree that that helps. Out. I mean, one of the, I think the, the best teachings I ever got, like, uh, you know, I love uh, the person who, who wrote my foreword, Dr. Shafali, of course, in great, incredible teacher with so many great books, but I saw her speak once and she said, love more, care less. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I love that. So, and I was like, what do you mean by that? But like, I love this. And this idea that like, uh, you know, we need to like the, there's a, there's a place for a little detachment for letting your kids be not perfect, but wonderful. Like letting mm-hmm. them be, have all their m- messy, imperfect moments, have all their like, uh, you know, say something ugly to their brother or sister and just not be in, in the, in it every single moment with them. Like you, if, if we can allow them space to be themselves and to have their growth as they're doing it. And, and if we like, you know, that idea of like kind of care less, like give them some space to, to just be a messy human, you know, as they need to be like, they don't, they don't have to be, yeah, uh, behave optimally in every moment. (laughs) None of us do anyway. Right. So like, like, let's just back off a little. We're going to pause for a one minute word from today's sponsor, Earth Breeze. As I'm talking about in today's episode, laundry has been a big part of my mental load for the past few months based on our home renovations and lack of access to a washer and dryer. Oh, and then in the midst of all that, I broke my ankle, so I couldn't carry anything heavy for quite a bit of that period of time, which is why I'm more appreciative than ever for Earth Breeze. EarthBreeze is a laundry detergent, which comes in the form of what they call eco sheets. They look like dryer sheets, but they're not. It's a liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. So there's no measuring, no mess, no heavy plastic jugs. Just toss the sheet in. It couldn't be easier. They've really made the whole concept of detergent better. But you don't have to just take my word for it. You can try it for yourself risk-free, 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like it, Earth Breeze will give you a full refund, no questions asked. So switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, my listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and get 40% off. Go to earthbreeze.com slash simple to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash simple for 40% off. earthbreeze.com slash simple. Thanks for supporting our sponsors. Back to my chat with Hunter. I find that um, we don't live near family, so we don't have as much intimacy with other extended family members or with the frequency. And um, I find that when we do, it's really helpful. So like a couple of weeks ago, we spent um, a long weekend with three other families, uh, good friends who have similar age kids. And that gives me so much perspective when I'm intimately Mm -hmm. in the space with other people's kids, because I see that it's all messy. Right. And I think Mm -hmm. when we, when we're parenting kind of in this vacuum, which because of COVID for so long, we were, we didn't have as much intimacy with other families, with kids and that sort of thing. These sort of long weekends where we're all staying in one house crowded together. Mm. um, That gives me, it's, it feels really good for me because it gives me perspective on I'm not alone. I see other kids have a hard time. I see other parents get exhausted, (laughs) you know, so that I think seeing it done in a broader perspective always helps. I think so too. And that goes back to what you were saying about the whole, like the long game, right? Like Mm -hmm. this is ideally a relationship you're developing for life. You're going to be with your kids for 18, you know, years, right? It's like a long time and you're going to be parenting them afterwards. And 
and, you know, we have to have remember the perspective of like a, on a day to day, moment to moment basis, right? Like we want to be as present as we can. Sure. But, you know, y- we're going to mess up, they're going to mess up all those things. And we have to just get that, remember that perspective of, you know, they, A, they need that, like they need you to mess up and show them, you know, show them how to then come back and repair. And, you know, they need to see you have like, you know, get upset sometimes, right? They, you know, they, they need, they need to have, be disappointed, you know, through, not that we have to like go out and show them how the world works, right? Like, which was kind of like that old school model, but like, mm-hmm. We don't make their favorite food and we make them stop playing and we have to we put them to bed and we make them brush their teeth and all of these things that yeah. they're just not happy with. And that's good. Like they need to learn, you know, this is in the long perspective, right? And even like the things like feelings, a big thing sometimes parents talk to me about is that they're worried about, they're worried about um, expressing um, n- difficult or negative feelings around their kids and that's that's a good worry to have like you don't want to be dumping your feelings on your kids you don't want to be saying you did this and now I feel terrible or make help me feel better I've had a terrible hard day and I need you to you know nothing like that right like we want to have friends adult friends and family and things like that to talk to but your kids are going to do idiotic frustrating, (laughs) messy things, you know, like, and like, you're, you know, just like back to your spilling of the, of the thing and all the clean laundry, like, and if you in that moment, you know, you're going through all this stress and you, you know, you have, you're super frustrated and then you try to like, pretend that you're not. And you're like, it's fine, honey. (laughs) You didn't mean it. Right. Okay. I'm fine. Right. right? Like through the clenched teeth, they know anyway, they know yeah. anyway, and then they learn not to trust you. So like when we can just name the feelings that we're having, it gives like it, it you model for them, like how to ha- have upset feelings, how to maybe make me- amends if you need to, right? Like all that needs to happen yeah. in the long run. Like you, if you've had a, one terrible day and you had a miserable day and you're crying in your bed at night, like that's okay. We're all going to have those days. You know, you can bounce back. There's time. You know, we're always growing and changing. And and in fact, there's a saying that I write about in Raising Good Humans Every Day that I love so, so much um, from the um, past teacher and um, Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. And he would say, no mud, no lotus. And this is the idea that you the lotus flower, which is the symbol of enlightenment, it grows in the pond through the disgusting, icky, gooey mud at the bottom, which is like gross. And the idea that like we need muck and mud, we need compost, like gardeners know we need disgusting cow poop and rotten vegetables <laughs> to grow beautiful flowers. Yeah. And it's the same with us. Like we need these difficulties. We need those difficult moments. We need all that to, to be able to become more compassionate, have that perspective, you know, have compassion for our kids, have compassion for ourselves. No mud, no lotus. I love mm-hmm. that. I love that too. Yeah. I think you had, and I don't remember the words you used when you said this earlier, but um, essentially kids come up with their own narratives, right? They come up with their own story. If, and if they, and if you're having a hard day and you're trying to smile through it and they can see right through whatever front you're putting on, I think sometimes that becomes more confusing, right? Like I've worked with a lot of parents who are like, oh, we haven't told the kids or the kids don't know, or like the kids know, but actually they don't really Mm -hmm. know. So if they sort of know and feel this tension or situation that's going on and you haven't explained it to them, there's a good chance that they've speculated and come up with their own narrative around why you might be upset or why you might be having a hard day. And there might be some self-blame in there. There's a good chance. Definitely. Definitely. Back circling back to egocentrism. They're yeah. they're probably telling a story about themselves that right. isn't too good. So yeah, I, I think it's one of the biggest things I want to encourage parents to do is just be themselves to be authentic, right? Like to give yourself permission to be you, not like mommy, you know, to be whoever your name is, right? Like to to don't don't talk about yourself in the third person. Be yourself, be human. And I there was a person who wrote a book a long time ago that I really love 
called soul to soul parenting and the idea is like don't don't be role to role you are the parent and i'm the child i'm mommy be soul to soul and i love that idea like mm. it just is like yes like it's okay for you to be a human yeah i am um, have had a handful of parents say to me i'm afraid i'm raising a jerk which is interesting. And I think thinking about your book, Raising Good Humans, it's kind of the antithesis of that. Um, have mm-hmm. you ever heard a parent say that, you know, they're worried about raising a kid that's a jerk, like just not a, not a nice human? Yeah. We're all worried about the idea of like a sociopath, like look at them. Mm-hmm. Are they going to become a sociopath? Later? <laughs> right. Like we always jump to like when they're in their twenties and they're yeah. just suddenly a sociopath. <laughs> yes. Jumping to conclusions there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I think um, that's tricky. I know it's hard because when we were jerks, we were punished, right? Like we were, we were told to go to our rooms or we were whatever. And so now we, we know better now, right? We know that punishment doesn't actually, isn't that effective. And in fact, it kind of makes kids kind of self-centered and just resent you. And it it doesn't help them learn very much, but we're like, okay, well, what happens now when my kids does something like is a jerk sometimes, right? Like, what do I do? Right. And I think this is where, you know, we, you know, it's, it's okay. Like going back also to guilt is a pro-social emotion. (laughs) It's good and helpful for your kids to understand how the effects of their behavior, right? The, Mm -hmm. not the The impact, like, yeah, like the consequences. And it's not like the consequences that I am putting upon you like you're losing your device because you hit your sister it's like when you do this this is how this affects me this is how it makes me feel this is how it affects her this is what's going on here this is what you need to learn about how your behavior is affecting the others in your environment right and when we have that glue of caring and love our kids really care about how they're they will really do care about how their behaviors affect you as a parent, you know, and, um, and their siblings and to some degree or another. Yeah. <laughs> but, well, um, but that's I think tricky, that that's though, because I feel just mm-hmm. to interrupt you. I feel like yeah, sometimes yeah. kids express that differently, right? So sometimes mm-hmm. kids will feel that, um, the, the impact of their behavior, which might be negative and they kind of shut down. And then as a parent, when you see a kid like that, when they shut down rather than jump to apologize or jump to show Mm. that empathy, Mm -hmm. sometimes it can seem like there's no empathy. Yeah. Yeah. We worry about that. I actually, that happens with my daughter, my older daughter a lot. Like she's not like a quick one to apologize. Like she kind of holds that in because it's hard for her to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. And that we, then we worry about that. Right. Mm -hmm. I think that back to the long game, right? Like as we are teaching our kids to care for other human beings, to care for each other, to care for animals, to care for the earth, like they're not going to show that every single day, but they're going to show it in other ways later. Like, you know, my daughter telling me to roll down the window and give the granola bar to the guy who's panhandling, right? Like make sure you give him that granola bar. And other different things, right? Like, and I, what I've seen it in my daughter, because I've had this worry about that. She's a little introverted and she has strong leadership qualities, <laughs> which is, it's, you know, it's funny, right? Like the way you frame things and then thinking about the long term. I've watched my older daughter, like basically in my brain, I was thinking the B word, like she was bossing around all these kids, mm-hmm. right? Like, and I was thinking that word, but I didn't let myself say it. And I was like, okay. She has strong leadership potential, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> but you know what? She she really did. Like yeah. we lived up to that label, right? It's, so it's really interesting to kind of think about what labels are you giving your kids and, and the importance of that. She's now getting her Eagle Scout this year. Um, mm. But anyway, like, so watching this child and being wondering a little about her empathy because her sister is like maybe very different and clearly more like in touch with other people's emotions, but then seeing it not necessarily in not necessarily all the time, right? Not in, but see, seeing it develop over the long term, right? And I think there's a trust that we have to have there of like you, you, you want to give what you want to receive, and you give your child empathy, you show you care, 
they're going to show you care, you know, and I've seen it, seen her show that empathy and that compassion again and again now as a, after kind of post adolescence, like post, like after 13, <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, there's a big level of trust that I think we have to have as parents that, that, you know, our little wild crazy little creatures whose brains are developing, we just keep giving them nourishing soil. We keep giving them attention, like loving attention. You know, we don't, you know, we don't have to like be perfect at it. We don't have to give them attention all the time, right? Like you're allowed to like, what do whatever you need to do in your life too. And not constantly, you know, be, you know, love more, care less, but trust that you're, trust that what you're, what you're sowing, what you, you know, the flower takes time. To yeah. Learn. I think about these kids who will sh sort of shut down or go within when they make a mistake rather than mm -hmm. jumping to apologies, mm -hmm. like, you know, like your daughter, you described that. Um, I wonder if some of these kids, not all of them, but if some of them are actually the kids that have the most empathy and that are mm. feeling it on another level, mm. right? Like that hurt that they have, may have caused or that impact that may have caused and they get overwhelmed by it, mm. which causes mm -hmm. them to shut down. And uh, sometimes yeah. I think that that may be true of some kids. So I think we're kind of misreading this as if they go quiet or they go within and we were like, oh, they didn't notice that what they did. They don't know, understand the impact of their actions. They don't have any empathy, but maybe they're just so overwhelmed with it that they don't know how to process it. I think that's very astute observation. And I think that goes to the idea that for us to bring, you know, in mindfulness, we have the attitudes of kindness and curiosity, right? And curiosity is on the opposite side of the spectrum from judgment. Mm -hmm. And our brains rush to judge. And that's okay. That's what brains do. But we can practice curiosity. And if we can say, okay, is my child actually really not empathetic? Am I only like, because sometimes you know how we, we, find what we look for. If we, if our mm -hmm. brain has said, oh no, my child's not empathetic. We're going to see all these instances, right? But if we can then practice beginner's mind, looking at your child as if you've never seen them before, practice curiosity. Is that really true? You might start to see evidence of the other side as well. Um, and open-mindedness. And I think that this is, this is such an essential quality to allow kids to become whoever they're going to become right is to to be curious like who are you today you know can i be open to get to know who you are today because they they are changing and growing so fast mm. i recently read a book called declarative language which is just this short little red book i think it's written by a speech pathologist but she's talking about the difference between imperative language and declarative language mm -hmm. imperative being you need to go brush your teeth declarative mm -hmm. being I wonder if you need, I wonder if it's time to brush your teeth, right? So using words like, I wonder, and I'm curious if, and taking some of the demand, you're still like putting it out there, but you're taking some of the demands away mm -hmm. and that some kids really respond well to that when they are not feeling like they're being told what to do all day, but yet you're still prompting them and giving them reminders in, in a slightly different way. Oh, I love that. I'm going to have to get that person on my podcast. That sounds <laughs> yeah. really fun to talk about yeah. um, because I love all the different ways we can do that. It's so interesting, like the way we talk with the kids, right? Like we're just like, we do order them around all day. If you right. listen to like kids right. at a playground, it's like sad. They're like, go, come here, go there, do this. Don't do that. Get down, get up. Right. You know, just like it's constant orders yeah. and commands. No one likes that. Not at right. any age. No one yeah. likes that. Like instead of saying it's time to do your ho homework, you can say, I wonder if it's time to do your homework. What do you think? You know, and cueing them to look at the clock mm. and see how much time it's going to take them to do their homework and making it a conversation rather than a demand. Mm. But this is easier, yeah. easier you, said than done. <laughs> it is it's easier. We, it, it involves a level like it's like this. It's like what you're talking about is like this sort of um, like surface of how we could speak, but what it's actually asking you to do is to be a little more open, mm -hmm. to let go of a little control and mm -hmm. to invite them into cooperation. And uh, that's the deeper work of the your declarative or sentences yes. there. <laughs> I remember the first time that I um, interviewed you, Hunter, was when my kids were much younger. I don't know, I think probably a toddler and a preschooler. And um 
you said something that really struck me. I'm going to have to go back and listen to the episode now, but you said something along the lines of you're not in control. And at that (laughs) point in parenthood for me, that like hit me pretty hard because I think that I was still really wrestling with that, like whether or not I, how much control I really have over these people and how I need to go about exercising that with care. So I just wanted to tell you that for, for whatever reason on that day, when you said that to me, you're, you're not in control today. I'm like, really? Are you sure? (laughs) Well, good. It was was a good moment of pause for me as as a parent. That's funny. I think as you describe it, it makes me think I'm, I'm remembering that moment and seeing like the reaction on your face and being like, okay. (laughs) I'd be like, yes, I am. Maybe a little argument there. But it's true though. We think we, we think we are. And it that is something I think we all have to wrestle with, right? Like right. we, we, you know, for many, if you're a biological parent, you're like, I made this child, you yeah. know, they came out of my body and, and, and that whole blank slate idea is pretty strong in our mm-hmm. culture. Even if you've read a bunch of things, uh, you know, it, about it and, you know, you know, that there's a lot of genetic and components and mm-hmm. you know you just I, I remember not having kids and looking at like some kids screaming at a you know rest stop and being like oh my kid's never gonna be that child you know like right. we all think we can like make that happen and boy is that a wake-up call yeah and I think you know in the early days it's we we have to control things in order to help our kids like we have to control their there's make, making mm, sure that food mm-hmm. is available to them and that they're getting sleep when they need to get sleep. So there, there is a lot of control. It's just learning how mm-hmm. to fade that when we need to fade that. Um, well, because we're yeah. not really in control of them and their emotions, but we're in control of providing for them in a reasonable way. And sometimes that's murky to divide, divide that up. Yeah. Yeah. It's like we have less and less and less as time goes on. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there's a thing in mindful parenting I teach about the idea of of like power versus influence and Mm. we power and influence are inverse, right? If Mm -hmm. you think of a graph with a diagonal line, power and influence have an inverse relationship. So the more power you use, the less influence you have. And then we get to this point where our kids are adolescents and then we've actually kind of run out of that power, right? Like, so if we're, we've been using power, like if we've been using, you know, threats and punishments and things like that, we kind of run out of that power and then we have no influence left Mm -hmm. if we've been using power. So I think that's like where this idea of adolescent rebellion really comes from is like the, that adolescents for a long while have been rebelling against the like unskillful use of power and the techniques our parents have been using. Right. You know, I'm, I love parenting teenagers. It's great. I love, it's really interesting, fascinating time now. And I still have influence. Like it's, it's really nice. I mean, I mean, I use some power. I wasn't like, like, you know, um, you know, maybe 80% out of 80, 20, right? Like maybe 80% yeah. skillful or whatever. Right. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that that's really important to think about is like this, like slowly, you know, you are the idea of discipline is to teach, like teaching, Mm -hmm. what are we teaching them? What are we teaching them? So we have to keep teaching and keep backing away. Like, you know, yeah, go out in the neighborhood. Like I've taught you how to cross all the streets. You know, I've taught you to memorize my phone number. I've taught you (laughs) to what to do when, like, if something were some weird person were to come by, you know, okay, like go forth and, you know, go get yourself some gummy bears from the lo- the farmer's market that you can walk to. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Hunter. It's been great chatting. Thank you so much, Danae. I really appreciate it. Tell us a little bit more about your new book that's coming out. Mm, well, it's Raising Good Humans Every Day it's a follow-up on Raising Good Humans, but it's exciting for me because it's a chance for me to expand into a bunch of areas I wasn't able to expand into in Raising Good Humans, which Mm. is really about um, mindfulness and skillful communication. And this has 50 short chapters. It's like a small book you can dive into at any different place. And it goes into a lot of different things um, about, you know, our home environment, relationships, 
ourselves. And so uh, well, I like it because I like those kind of books where every day you can kind of read like and you can be a little inspired. Yeah. Like I'd like the idea of them just doing like something for a week. Um, yeah. So it's everywhere books are sold, raising good humans every day. I love that. I think that something you can keep in your bag and just pick it up and read a couple lines and not feel like it's something you're leaving unfinished, right? Or leave it by your bedside table and reference it, but it's not like one thing you haven't, yeah. you meant to do today and you hadn't done just kind of it's there when you need it. I, I love short chapters. I feel such yeah. a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> right. So this is what I want for my parents is like, yes. you can read a te- you can read three pages and your parenting will improve this week. Right. I promise. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Well, thank you so much, Hunter. I appreciate your time. Thank you. I, I love it. I've had a great time. Thanks so much for tuning in. This has been episode 354. I appreciate you being here and I'll talk with you next month.